Hello there, Evie here. Welcome to my air cooled review of the Fractal Design No Dato 4. If you like the video, please give it a like and consider subscribing to check out more videos like this one. As usual, we'll do a quick run around the case to check out all the case's features, and then we'll do a system build in there. In this week's video, we'll be doing an air cooled build. Once we've done the build, we'll be checking out the thermal results with just the standard case fans, and then we'll be plying the case with a pile of extra fans to see what the case can really do. Next week, we'll be doing a water cool build, so stick around if you want to check that one out. I hope you enjoy the video, and I'll catch you in a second for the commentary. Alright then, opening up the packaging, we can see that £100 or $110 gets you the same polystyrene and plastic bag packaging as pretty much any other case. Nothing special, but it seems to have done the job. The Fractal Design Node 804 is a Micro ATX case which supports Mini ITX and Micro ATX motherboards. It sports a steel chassis and steel side panels with a brushed aluminium front and various pieces of plastic components and trim. The front I.O. can be found to the side of the case, which consists of two USB 3.0 ports, the power switch and separate headphone and microphone jacks, and above these is a slit for an optional slot-in optical disk drive. The top features a full grille for strong ventilation, which is housed by the only plastic panel on this case, but it's not glossy and doesn't pick up fingerprints too badly, so there's no complaints here. The rear's got quite a lot to offer. To the bottom left is the position for the power supply unit, and to the bottom right houses the reusable and replaceable PCI Express lock covers. And up top you can find two of the three included 120mm 1200rpm 3-pin fans with a central motherboard position. And the last panel is, of course, the side panel window, which is plastic so it's easy to scratch. Therefore, it's advisable that you remove the plastic film after installing your system. So, let's get inside and have a look around. Each of the panels requires the removal of two thumb screws each and has a slot back and lift out mechanism. The rear of the motherboard compartment includes the PCI Express slot covers seen earlier, with overflow ventilation to its left, and again seen earlier is one of the included 120mm fans with the rear I.O. slot to its right. Above the fan is a manual fan speed controller with support for three 3 pin fans, which requires power through a SATA power connector. It's a nice option and there is potential to be able to use splitters to increase its capacity. The top of this compartment can support up to two 120 or 140mm fans and a 240 or 280mm radiator, which is just the start of cooling options. And the front of this compartment continues this trend with the support for two 120mm fans and a 240mm radiator, which currently supports the third included 120mm fan. And the bottom of this compartment can support two 2.5 inch or 3.5 inch drives, with cable management for this approach to the bottom of the motherboard tray. Onto the other side, again removing two screws and sliding the panel out again gains us access to the internals. Starting at the front, there is support for an additional two 120mm fans and a 240mm radiator. The top is where this case gets really interesting. With both of these hard disk drive sleds in place, there is support for up to eight 3.5 inch hard disk drives, and with the right brackets, 16 2.5 inch hard disk drives or SSDs. Or you could remove both of these cages for an additional two 120 or 140mm fans and a 240 or 280mm radiator. The rear of this compartment houses one of the included 120mm fans seen earlier, with support to upgrade it to an optional 140mm fan in the future. And below this is the position for an ATX power supply unit, which has a filter to support a fan side down setup. In front of the power supply unit position are some included velcro straps to hold down the bulky power cables, but if you were to remove these then you could shift one of the hard disk drive cages here, which would allow you to fit in that top radiator. Also, with a standard sized 160mm ATX power supply unit, or likely a versatile 180mm high power power supply unit, you could get away with an extremely water-cooled high storage system, I'm thinking somewhere along the lines of an editing slash NAS system. Moving on to the accessories box, there's quite a lot on offer to support all these options. First off, there's the bracket for the optical disk drive, 5 zip ties, 8 replacement hard disk drive dampeners, a crosshead standoff tool, 4 optical disk drive screws, 2 optical disk drive bracket screws, 4 power supply unit screws, 28 2.5 inch drive and motherboard screws, 7 motherboard standoffs, and 40 3.5 inch hard disk drive screws. Now we've covered the vast array of screws available, let's take a look at the top panel. After removing the two screws to the rear, sliding the panel back and lifting it away, we can see the true potential this case has. It's got a fantastic balance between cooling potential, structural rigidity and its sheer amount of options. 
As for the top panel itself, it's fully ventilated and filtered with a foam layer, but it also has these fins built in that not only provide strength to the panel, but also direct exhaust airflow towards the back of the case, away from the user and the front intakes. It's this kind of design that goes that step further to enhance the user experience, without the user necessarily being aware that it even exists. That changes good design into excellent design. The front panel pops off easily enough with a fairly gentle pull, and since the cables connected to the front I.O. need to be routed through the front of the chassis, the front panel will rarely be able to move far from the case unless you want to reroute the cables every time you remove the front panel. But it's made up for by the functionality of the inside of the panel. Here you can store an additional two 2.5 inch drives which have cable management loops below them. And to the right is the space for the optical disk drive, which will require the installation of the optical disk drive bracket seen earlier. Bear in mind you will need a slot in style optical disk drive here, but I think it's a great compromise between looks and practicality, especially in a time where optical disk drives are rarely used by most users. And looking to the front of the case you can see the intake dust filters, which I have a couple of issues with, but I'll show you that a little later on. And between the dust filters are three cable management holes that lead between both compartments, allowing cables to be routed either way. But for the sake of usability, the front panel can go back on for now, and we'll take a quick look at the bottom of the case before we start building in the system. At the bottom you'll find four large rubber feet, which are greatly appreciated, and the small power supply unit filter, as well as a larger filter beside it. Note that the longer filter isn't there for fans to be mounted above it, it's actually there to filter the air that comes in from a GPU that could be mounted to the lower PCI Express slot, which I thought was a nice little inclusion. Now moving on to what it's like to build in. To start I'm going for the larger of the two power supply units I use, which is the 180mm long, 750W, 80 plus Platinum Be Quiet Dark Power Pro 11. Installing it was a breeze, since the space available inside is vast. Once in position on top of the case's four rubber pads, four screws can secure it to the case from the rear, and we can move on to getting the motherboard in. It's at this point I'd like to say it's useful to cover your workspace with some sort of protective layer, preferably anti-static, to prevent damage to the finish of your case and your work surface. Flipping the case onto its side makes the motherboard installation much easier for me to do and for you to see, and as usual it's always good to start off by installing the rear IO shield with a few gentle pushes around the edges. Then the included standoffs can be installed in their various positions to suit your motherboard. One thing I found a little unusual was the lack of a pre-installed standoff post, just a pre-installed standoff to the lower left. Now the motherboard can be lowered into position and the included standoff screws can be installed to secure the motherboard in place. Just a little information about this system. We have an MSI Z170M mortar motherboard, 16 gigs of G-Skill Ripjaws 5 RAM, 8 gigs of Crucial Ballistics RAM and an i7-6700K being cooled by a Cooler Master Hyper 212 EVO. With the motherboard comfortably installed without any clashes or restrictions, we can route the major cables into position before taking a look at those hard disk drive cages. To remove the hard disk drive cages requires the removal of two screws, then they simply slide off the rails which I thought was really neat, and since I'm only going to be occupying one of the sleds later, I thought I'd remove the other one to improve airflow and make building in the case easier. With the hard disk drive cages out of the way, the CPU power cable can be routed up to the top right hole. Unfortunately, there aren't any cable management loops around the perimeter of the motherboard section to keep the cables in place. Something I found a little unusual was a hole in the top panel to help with guiding the cables between both compartments. And thanks to the access from above, this was one of the easiest CPU power connections I've ever done. Moving on to the 24 pin motherboard power connector, I feel there's a little something missing here too. Since there is a large hole, there is little support or guidance for the cable between the two compartments. A little tip for this type of connector, it's generally easier to install the 4 pin additional connector before installing the 20 pin main connector instead of trying to install all in one. And finally for now, we can do a pre-routing of the GPU power cables ready for use later. This means with all the major power cables going into the main compartment routed, we can use those included velcro straps seen earlier to hold them down and out of the way. I also decided to move the power connectors in the power supply unit into their lower slots to reduce strain on the cables and the connectors. Now onto the hard disk drive cage. Normally I don't get out of the 3.5 inch hard disk drives since most cases don't have a system that is unusual or needs explaining further. However, in this case I thought it would be more necessary to get an understanding of the proportions of this system. 
Installing a drive into these sleds is simply a case of lowering the drive into the cage and aligning the screw holes together. When the screw holes are aligned, four of the included 3.5 inch hard disk drive screws can be inserted through the pre-installed hard disk drive dampeners to secure the drive in place. I'll throw a couple into the case to represent how they would look, but they won't be connected to the motherboard or the power supply unit since they're not in use anymore. So with the two installed into the sled, it can be slid into the case and secured in place by the two screws removed earlier. Something to take note of is that there isn't a large amount of space between the end of the sled and the motherboard tray, or even the motherboard itself, so be careful not to bunch up the cables and cause too much pressure against the back of the motherboard. In this situation, the cables were just pressing against the case, so I'm not going to get too concerned. Now for the slightly more challenging part of this case, which still isn't really that challenging. Installing the 2.5 inch hard disk drives requires the drives to be inserted behind this plastic bracket, and then secured in place by screws through the top. I really appreciate the thought behind the support for 2.5 inch hard disk drives, they don't really take up that much room anywhere they go with minimalistic support such as this. While the install is going on in the background, I like to point out that I've been using this system in this configuration for the editing process of this video, and I'm happy to report that even though these drives are of the spinning variety, they don't cause the front panel to vibrate creating any noise, which could have been an issue if the front panel wasn't secured properly. Routing the power and SATA data cables wasn't really an issue, I'm okay with a tight approach like this if it's designed well. However, it's worth pointing out that depending on the power cables you have, this approach can go a couple of different ways. For me, the intermediate power connectors have side connecting cables, which is an awkward connection in tight spaces. So it's worth having the intermediate connector further in where there is more room due to the bow of the panel, and have the end connector further out where there is less room. At this point you can opt for using the cable management loops, but I preferred having the cables more flexible when returning the panel to the chassis. This is where things get a little awkward, since I'm using the 3 connector SATA power cable, the third connector caused a bit of trouble going back through the hole, but with a bit of work it's not too much of a hassle to sort out since there's plenty of accessibility around that area. And it didn't take more than a minute before the panel was back in position like before. Now onto the installation of the third 2.5 inch drive, which is of course the SSD, which is nice enough to have on show, so this will be going on the floor of the case. Throwing the excess cables into the large space in the power supply unit compartment, we can turn the case over to gain access to the base. Here we can slide the larger filter out, which exposed all of the screw holes. It's now a simple job of supporting the SSD inside the case with one hand and installing the screws with the other. Of course, when all four screws are in, you can return the filter to its position. Note that the intake capacity will be reduced through the bottom now, and then we can turn the case back over for connecting the power cables and data cables. This is a little awkward since the space is a little restricted on both sides, but with a bit of feeling around, it's not that difficult to connect both cables. Now we can feed all the SATA data cables through to the front compartment and connect them to the motherboard. I always find that installing these connectors leaves one of the ports in an awkward position due to the case's panel, but it comes together well enough despite this. Front I.O. is pretty simple to deal with, since there's only the front audio connector, hard disk drive LED, power LED, power switch and a single USB 3.0 connector that serves both USB 3.0 ports. Which is so much better than having a USB 3.0 and 2.0 port, this should be the standard. But take note that there is no reset switch, so hard restarts will have to be done through the power button, which isn't really a big deal. Since I'm going to be using a fan hub controlled by a CPU fan curb, I won't be needing to use this included manual fan controller. A nice addition is that the cables disconnect so it won't clutter up the case if you choose not to use it. Speaking of the fan hub, we'll be using all 8 headers on it later for our maximum thermal test. And now all that's left to do is install the graphics card, which of course starts by removing all the relevant PCI Express slot covers, which are removable and replaceable, and are made from steel with a nice white powder coating. Once the slot covers are out of the way, the PCI Express notch on the card can be lined up and pushed into the PCI Express slot on the motherboard. Make sure if you're running two cards to relocate all drives below somewhere else as to not restrict airflow for the lower GPU. And with the GPU in place, we can replace all the screws removed earlier and connect the power cables that we routed earlier. With the system fully installed and ready to go, it's time to replace all the panels removed earlier and check out the results for the standard thermal test. Unfortunately, fitting the steel side panel was not as smooth as I'd hoped it would be. Due to the size of the screws that came with the power supply unit, the panel couldn't rest flat against the case. 
So, I had to replace it with one of the included power supply unit screws that came with the case. What is strange though is that there is a groove cut out for the large thumb screw above, so maybe in a future revision of this case, the cutting tool of choice could be run over this area too. Anyway, that's just one small thing I noticed, but by no means a deal breaker. So let's move on to the thermal testing results with the system in its current form. Unfortunately, the test didn't go as well as the build. The CPU thermal throttled to a point of no return at the 4.5 minute mark, but the GPU managed to complete the test and ended at 94 degrees. Compare this result to the other cases tested so far and we're looking at a pretty poor result. Bear in mind this is under a torture test scenario so this isn't a typical load. Unless you're pushing your CPU regularly you'll probably be unscathed by these cooling issues. But what if you're the kind of person to push their system to the max on a regular occasion? Well you're probably the same person that will probably use all 8 fan headers on their fan hub. So that's what we're gonna do. Enter the maximum thermal test where we replace all stock fans with premium Vada fans and throw in as many additional fans as this case can support. Unfortunately for me, I haven't got all the components to support 10 fans, so we'll be focusing all our cooling power on the main compartment where the CPU and GPU lie. In the front, we will remove the stock 120mm 1200rpm fan and it will now house two 120mm 2200rpm EK Vada F4120ERs. And of course the rear fan will also be replaced with another EK Vada 120mm 2200rpm fan. And to the top we're adding two 140mm 2000rpm EK Vada F3-140ERs. The front one will be an intake since exhausting air at that point would be stupid, and the rear will be exhausting air which should assist the current rear exhaust fan. So, did any of that have an impact on the results, or is this front ventilation strip just not big enough to support this system at full load? Well, to my surprise, it actually did amazingly well. We managed to knock nearly 10 degrees off the CPU and lower the GPU temperature down by 8 degrees, with no thermal throttling in sight. Compare this to all the other cases tested so far, and this case is throwing punches with the open air test bench for both CPU and GPU results. So clearly this case has a huge sea of potential in nearly every aspect from system versatility to performance. So let's take a look at the final build and I'll catch you afterwards for a wrap up. So there we have it, an amazingly versatile case with cooling performance to boot. It's got one of the larger footprints of Micro ATX cases around, but at least it's doing something with it. 
Personally, I see this case as having the potential to be an extremely competent NAS, but in reality, I can only really see its potential being used by a small company rather than by a gamer or a home user. But then again, I'm sure there are some extreme users or content creators out there that need this kind of capacity and style. But most of us would likely empty our banks before we could max out this case, and if you're looking for an MATX case with expansion for a lifetime, I think you've stumbled across a winner. On a final note about the case, I'd recommend either using the included fans with the manual controller or replacing them outright with some nice high quality fans. They don't seem to play too well with a fan hub and run a little louder than I'd like, so much so that I disconnected the last one after the max cooling test to record this audio. Anyway, thank you so much for checking out my air cooled review, that's right I'm calling them reviews now, of the Fractal Design Node 804. Next video we'll be water cooling this beast to see where the cooling potential really lies. Thanks again for checking out the video and I hope to catch you in the next one.